Our conversation ended yesterday when I publicly said, well, you've got to come back to carry on the conversation today when we were talking not about Liz Truss on the Marshall Plan rebuilding uh, Ukraine, as, as David Liddington was just talking about, but Liz Truss on arming up Moldova. And we've just heard on this programme, Mr Podilyak from uh, the Zelensky private office saying Russia's not given up yet. Russia's regrouping, considering its options. That was exactly the warning that you ended on uh, yesterday. Well, I just don't think this is going to end anytime soon. And although it's quite interesting to have a discussion about what constitutes victory for Ukraine, and there's not much that your guests have said this morning, which I would, uh, I would disagree with, um, I think the most you can say is that morally, Ukraine is the victor already, because it has already disproved a whole number of heresies and stupidities which uh, Putin and his clique um, have said about the country. Um, but territorially, and to some extent militarily, you cannot say that Ukraine is the victor, nor can you say that Russia is the victor either. There is just a bloody war of attrition, which is starting to look a little bit like um, some of the episodes in the First World War, where artillery uh, became more important than troops. Um, and uh, that is what we see today. Now, if we're going to start talking about uh, uh, diplomacy, that the thing can only be ended by diplomacy, absolutely true. I and mean, what Zelensky said yesterday was uh, a statement of the obvious. Only diplomacy can end this. But diplomacy itself must reflect something that's going on on the battlefield. And it is only when Russia and Ukraine decide that the moment has come where they really need to resume talking, that we may be on a path to a diplomatic settlement. Um, that, that actually is an optimistic vision. A pessimistic vision is the Russians go home to some extent, lick their wounds, raise another bunch of conscripts, train them to basic standards that were not, not very high, and the steamroller starts again. And we, I, mean, I, I, I like to look at this in a historical setting because you saw this time and time again in the First World War until the revolution um, of, uh, of 1917, where the Russian army was beaten to pieces by the Germans and the Austrians, regrouped, uh, raised another conscript army, sent them into battle, few early successes, smashed to pulp, until finally the whole thing fell apart in, uh, as I said, in, 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 in 17. So uh, this, this, we've got to prepare for the possibility that this could last almost a decade. And in that view, we have to take some very fundamental decisions. Can we, we NATO as an alliance, deal with a Russia ruled by President Putin, or is his removal an indispensable requirement, an indispensable precondition for getting into talks? Now, what I don't know is whether we are actually in the uh, chambers uh, of NATO in the halls of diplomacy. Are we talking about these things? Because David Liddington. Although they may say, uh, I'm just going to bring yeah. David in, Christopher, to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, because I, 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 I think we have to um, be clear that the, the removal of President Putin whoever, and whoever succeeds him has to be a choice for the Russian people. I think that it would be a mistake for NATO to declare that as one of its own objectives. Uh, and I think that the, the time for talks is when the Ukrainian government is ready to engage in talks with a Russian government led by whoever that is willing to engage in those. Um, so I, I, I differ very slightly, I think, from, 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 from Christopher and on, on some of that. I do, I do think, and I agree strongly with him there, that there is no possibility of going back to any sort of normal relationship with President Putin. I think he has demonstrated his duplicity and his ruthlessness again and again during this conflict. Did I misread your shaking of the head well, when, when Christopher no, was saying I, I Putin has to go? I think we really have to learn from past uh, mistakes. I mean, to talk about regime changes, uh, it really actually would strengthen Putin's hand, frankly. And I think we have to look beyond this. We have to look at a, at a Russian um, military machine that has, has suffered a bloody nose, uh, seemingly sensible people. I, I remember Sergei Lavrov at the United Nations, a seemingly sensible person, turned into this kind of monster. But these people are very dangerous in the corner. And I think we have to look beyond this. You know, Russia may be a very different country. And actually, you know, Sir Christopher just alluded to it, 1917, how quickly things can happen. 
So it's conceivable there could be change in Russia, but it has to come from the Russian people. Okay, final question. We could do this for hours, and I thoroughly (laughs) enjoy it, and I hope it most importantly has helped people at home understand just what is at stake here. But the final question draws a line under that, and I'm going to start with Christopher, then come to Mark and David. Um, The UK's position in the world, it strikes me, has also changed, whether it's our leadership role in terms of supporting the Ukrainians or relationships between the UK government and the European Union post-Brexit. NATO's always been OK. Has our position been enhanced and permanently in the world, Christopher? Well, I think our position has certainly been enhanced because we've been seen to stand and to have stood actually for several years now for some very important democratic principles such as the sovereignty and independence of of Ukraine. And and if we can't stand up for something like that, what can we stand up for? So I think the fact that we've been very forward-leaning on this, firstly with the training of the Ukrainian army and then with the provision of of hard weaponry um, and cash, um, has been an important point for the UK and will be a lasting um, accolade, if you like, for the role we've played in this um, in this terrible conflict. So I think it is a plus. I'm not particularly concerned about Brexit here. I mean, I actually don't think Brexit on this made a huge amount of difference. No. Totally. I accept the that. European Christopher, I've got to draw a line because we're heading towards a break. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't behave, I'll book you again for next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Always oh a pleasure God, to see you. To, <laughs> um, <laughs> to clarify, because I, I mm. completely take his point about Brexit. I wasn't making it a Brexit yeah, point, but post-Brexit, much of the really grown-up political debate is about UK's yeah. role, its relationship with Europe, and its place in the world. So the same question to you. Are we enhanced and are we permanently enhanced? Enhanced. And though on certain other policy matters, I've been pretty critical of some things the present government have have done on Ukraine. I think their calls have been absolutely right and strongly support the strategy that they have initiated. I think it has reminded European leaders in other countries that the UK in or out of the EU, remains one of the core players in European defence and security policy. And and that gives us an opportunity to rebuild relationships with other European countries that have become very bruised. We can argue about the reasons for that. Very bruised over the last few years. And crucially... I remind folk at home who used to edit Tribune, a Labour magazine, Mm. one of of, of great merit, in my humble opinion. It's also impacted on UK politics as far as Labour is concerned and its attitude towards NATO and its attitude towards defence. So in your view, with that background nod, <laughs> UK's position enhanced and permanent? Well, I, I think so. Um, I, but I also think that the m- more important thing is actually the UN Charter. And we will enhance ourselves even further if we can show this consistency. We've shown, I think, great leadership over Ukraine. Glad to see it. But if I was to go back to the UN now... Lots of people from the global south will be saying, well, good for you, Britain, but, you know, you should also be clear that you made a mistake about Iraq. We want to see some consistency over the Palestinian territories, all of these sorts of things. Get that right, and then you can take some really strong moral leadership. Absolutely. Oh, they might be listening to us even more. (laughs) Uh, For the time being, I've already said thank you to Christopher. Uh, uh, Mark Seddon, always a pleasure to see you, and David Liddington also. Thank you both very much indeed for being here and for coming in.